I ask Jenny if I can get some extra shifts at the pub? And you've got enough on your plate. You've got two jobs. You're looking after five kids. On top of that, you've been going to some of Paul's appointments with him. You're doing fundraising for him. It's only a certain amount of hours in the day. I don't mind being busy. Yeah, you two better get off anyway. See you. See you at the contest, Iron Guts. Talk of the street. Talk of the street. The talk of the street. Talk of the street. The talk of the street. Talk of the street. The talk of the street. Talk of the street. Hello and welcome to episode 261 of The Talk of the Street, an unofficial Coronation Street catch-up podcast that doesn't mind having storylines across multiple weeks, but really expected to get some instant closure on what Billy and Paul were going to have for their tea. I'm Gavin. (laughs) And I am me. We've hit a new low. We have. You'd be as well just saying I'm Helen in this case. I've, I've, I've had a week. You've all had a week, haven't we? I just don't have the energy to think of something quippy. And I'm just not going <laughs> to... Apparently not, but, but pray, let's continue anyway. Yes, let's continue. How was your week? That was all right. Fourth of July was nice. Fourth of July doesn't mean anything to me anymore now that I don't drink. It's a boring, <laughs> pointless holiday. Oh, 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 oh. And it seems to be mostly celebrated by people who I don't think I'd be friends with in real life. The parade was nice. It went on too long and we like gave up as soon as Benny was done marching with the soccer team and went and had ice cream instead hmm. and just watched the people watching the parade. Because it's just, it's the longest parade we have. It's longer than the Memorial Day parade. It's longer than the Christmas parade, you know, because like this is the parade that politicians can march in. And farmers drive their tractors in. Oh, God, and fire trucks, so many so fire many trucks. So many fire trucks, which, you I, know, I really hope there are no fires on the 4th of July. It's just as well that we're not <laughs> sending fiery sticks of wood up into the sky. Right, when our, when our grass when is still... Our, when all our fire trucks are lining up on our main street. Right, and our grass is still very, very dry because we haven't had enough rain this year. Hmm. See, it's one thing when we're in Connecticut... Because my brother has this huge pig roast every year. Don't think he does that anymore. Yeah, because we're not there. Well, I think I've been to that once or twice. No, you've been more than once. Twice then. Yeah, well, he he would have this huge pig roast where like we would go and pick up a whole pig and bury it in the ground with with hot coals. And it would cook for like over 24 hours in the pit. And then there would be a celebration when the pig is pig emerges fully cooked from the ground. You remember this differently from me. It's quite pagan when you think about it. Well, the way that you're describing it is, <laughs> you're and describing then, Midsommar, as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. That, that's not how I remember it. You know, and there's lots of other good food. My my sis, my sister-in-law Madeline makes the very best rice I've ever had in my entire life. Her Spanish rice is just the most glorious thing you've ever put in your mouth. Especially when you put pig in your mouth as well. And, n- and not the way that David Cameron does it. Ha ha! Katang cheek tea. Well, that's topical. <laughs> anyway. You We're know. getting away from the fact here that the 4th of July sucks and it's a pointless vacation now. But it gives you a. A day off work, so right. it's hard not to complain about it's it. It's tough when it's a Tuesday. So we just went to the movies, and I was actually quite surprised at how many people just went to the movies. Right. Well, it was air-conditioned. It was quite hot on the 4th of July. Nobody wants to be outside. You know, I said to you that I wished we had friends who would invite us over for a, for a cookout. Because we have no friends. We have friends, but we don't have friends that we go over to their house for a cookout sort of friends. No. Nope. And, uh... And in fairness, we never invite anybody over here either. It seems to be the, we the stumbling point. We haven't done that in a in a very long time. But yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be outside sitting in a lawn chair 
beside a hot barbecue on a day like our 4th of July was this year. You know, I, I much preferred being in a nice air conditioned theater with a bunch of other people not laughing at no hard feelings. You were laughing the way you could still at no hard feelings. I, I there Don't were a pretend couple that of you're things. too cool for school here. You were chuckling away good style. There were a couple of things that I laughed at. Most of them were things that I laughed at while watching the trailer. But yeah, you didn't laugh at all. You laughed more at Indiana Jones. I thought that was quite funny. I quite enjoyed Indiana Jones. Yes, because Harrison Ford is a funny guy. He's a funny guy. He's got this dry, wry sense of humor that's just, it's good. He's the funny guy in Star Wars as well. Which I think is why the solo movie didn't work, because that guy wasn't Harrison Ford. That's he right. wasn't funny. Poor Danny Glover. Danny, no, Donald Glover. God, I feel Danny racist Glover now. really is too old for this shit. Right, yeah. Donald Glover was the one getting all the jokes in, and yet he is no Billy D. Williams. And that's my little, my li- my little Star Wars bit for the, for the, for the week. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a week. So, yeah, you want you to t- start again? I don't feel like any of this is worth saving. You, re- you really want to start again? You want to go through all of that again? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Shall we preamble with you? Yes, please. And give us some of that traitorous Cody news. Oh! They may, they may revoke your, your, American citizenship for saying things like that on air. Fine by me. <laughs> Can they take mine too? <laughs> anyway, Dame Maureen Lipman may be taking a break from the show, but that hasn't stopped her from bagging four Inside Soap Awards nominations. Did she? Yeah. This week? This week. Four. Best Actress. Best Comedic Performance. Best Partnership, alongside our Royson, and as a member of the cast for Best Soap. Which I don't know if we can necessarily yeah, count so that, yeah. but all of the articles I read counted it. So, we're counting it too. She's just, she's just eating it up. Eating it up, and good for her. Pretty good. Let's hope that she gets a... Uh, she gets at least one. Gets something. Yeah. Are you curious about... The other members of the cast who may be nominated for an Inside Soap Award? I am now. Well, let me tell you. Charlotte Jordan and Elle Mulvaney are also up for Best Actress. Alongside Maureen Lippman. Wow. Can you imagine being a young woman and having to be nominated against Maureen Lippman? See, I, I, I think that I think both of them probably stand a better chance. Well, we'll see. Because of the type of storyline that they were involved in. Well, yes. Yes. David Nielsen, Peter Ash, and Ryan Prescott are all up for Best Actor. Very good. Yes. Andrew Still and Todd Boyce are both up for Best Villain. Oh, good. I'm glad that Andrew Still's getting some yes. recognition there, because he was creepily good. He was as, creepy as fuck. As Scottish stalker. So creepy. Justin. Did yes. you need my guitar for that? No. Okay. Patty Clare is also up for Best Comedic Performance. Well done to our Mary. Yeah, she was good. Uh, Shanique Sterling-Brown and Jodie Pranger are both up for Best Newcomer. Fantastic. And it's a catch-22 because I love them both. I love them both equally. So They both add so much to the show when they're on. So here is Sophie's choice then. Yes. Which one would you pick? To Live? Yes. <laughs> one wins Best Newcomer, and the other one dies. dies. Don't make me choose. I think I'm going to hold your feet to the fire here. <laughs> Sally Jennifer and nope. Joe Dettin are also up for best partnership against against more um, Maureen Lipman and David Nielsen. Um, Isabella Flanagan and Jude Reardon are once again up for best young performer. Mm-hmm. That'll be every year until they breach the. The, right. the age limit. What is the is. age limit? I guess it's maybe sixteen. Because you'd think you'd think Patty Bever would be on that list as well. Well, he'll be over sixteen. Yeah. Uh, the Platts and the Winter Browns are both up for Best Family. I don't know who nominated the Winter Browns. Well, 
Is, is this just a sympathy vote for, for how horribly this family is treated on the show? Uh, More on that later. It's got to be real, isn't it? Uh, Amy's rape and Daisy Stalker are up for best storyline. Oh, say that cheerier. <laughs> say that. Yay. Oh, cheery, please. Yay. Cheerily. Let's assault more women Cheerily. for awards. Woohoo. And the man who learned most about himself thanks to a woman's trauma is. is... <laughs> the acid attack and Gemma and Chesney's wedding are both up for best showstopper. <laughs> I, it's never going to win, but I hope Gemma's wedding picks that up. That was brilliant. <laughs> what does it say about the show? That the best showstopper is either an acid attack <laughs> that stops a wedding or a brilliant wedding with a big ass orange dress mm -hmm. with lights. Did love that dress. So oofed. Lots and lots of nominations this year. Yeah. Fantastic. I think well we done are, to the show. We are going up against uh I say we. Mm. We're going up against uh, an EastEnders that is... The brain cancer one? That is getting an awful, an awful lot of praise at the moment. Is that so the brain cancer one? Just in general, I think, uh. the show seems to be firing on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these things are cyclical. They, they come are. and go. They are, so indeed. We will see. Yes. And finally, Phoebe may not be the new Lois Lane. Rachel Brosnahan was chosen for that role. But that hasn't stopped the Denver family from continuing their acting domination. As other daughter Hattie has landed her first TV gig as Libby Guthrie on Waterloo Road. So the best kind of Nepo babies. Oh, wow. The babies of Sally's people Nepo I like. <laughs> Sally's Nepo Sally's babies. Sally's Nepo babies. Just. Are there any other Denvers that we should be aware of in the, keep on, in the future? Keep it on. I don't. I seem to think there's a sun somewhere, but there may not be. I'll tell you what, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Both of those girls look a lot like their mum. Yeah, she has three children. The other one a boy, am I right on that? Uh, Her husband's an actor too, isn't he? I can only confirm that two are daughters. <laughs> it doesn't tell us about the third one. Well... I look forward to child number three one day getting their first actor gig. Number three, Denver. Number three, Devener. Step to, on up. I used to stay in at number three, Denver. But, <laughs> but then I had to move because that thing happened. Yes. That thing with the hot tub. We don't talk about it. Wow. And that's Corey News. That's Corey News. Let's see who's written in to us in the section that has YouTube music, but it's called Everyone's a Critic. Thanks to Mark this week, who, within moments of our last episode going live, got in touch with the scans of the OK article that Helen couldn't see last week. <laughs> yes. Yes, he did. What a delightful human being. But so very prompt. Mark, if you want to write any content for us going forward, <laughs> feel free. Especially for the first bit. <laughs> And then Ian Les Paul also got in touch. He got in touch on Facebook to mention that Seagull, the co the company that mm -hmm. uh, was the consultancy firm for Stephen, right, is a guitar company from Quebec, which is where our smoke was coming from last week. Mm. The town of La Patrie is virtually a company town where everyone's a luthier, and I actually owned a Seagull twelve string guitar back in the day. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful instrument, and I got it so cheap. And I thought, I must be ripping somebody off here because there's uh -huh. no way in the world that this guitar should be so cheap because it sounded so good, so great. So I have a very high regard for Seagull guitars. And actually, I may postpone my next new guitar, which was going to be a Martin Jr. bass guitar. Oh, was it now? And I might be looking at some Seagull 12 strings instead. Ooh. So when you give me something to think about, you know, Les Paul. Feedback is always welcome. Send us your thoughts and I probably will read them out. Yeah, yep. send us negatives. Send us negatives? Yeah, send us criticism. I love criticism. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. I will happily do that. <laughs> Not you. I have notes. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> you can get us at the talk of the street at gmail.com or our DMs are always open at Corey Podcast. And now we will podcast for coffee.
Thank you to Tina W for our coffees this week. Thank you, Tina. Tina writes, love listening to the podcast every week. Thanks for making my Cory viewing complete. Aw, that's so nice. I think what Helen would have preferred you to say was, you are fucking awful. <laughs> Give me my money back. No refunds. <laughs> no refunds. No refunds. You can't you get nothing much. from nothing. Tina W, I, I jest. That's a very lovely thing to write. And then Trisha also bought us her coffees this week. Thank you, Trisha. And Trisha says, thanks as always for one of my absolute favourite shows. So, Aww. I'm sorry. All I've got this week is praise. Oh, well. Thank you both <laughs> for your kind donations. I'm we, sure somebody hates us. Oh, or it, I'm or sure it, most people hate or us. Or at least me. <laughs> There's got to be something annoying about my voice. I'm a woman. <laughs> and you're American. I am. <laughs> it's not your fault. Not one complaint about vocal fry. I, 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 just, I feel like I, I'm, I'm a good really speaker. You don't really vocal fry. No, but... People complain about vocal fry, People even with I women. People I work with do it all the time. And that even with women who who don't do vocal fry get complaints about vocal uh, fry. Well, no, that sort of stuff. You don't do uh, that. And if you do do it, I cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. What a delightful human being you are. Thank you so Almost much. Almost as nice as Mark. Thank you so much for your your donations, Tina and Trisha. We yes. appreciate it very much. The Toggle Street is and will always be free on your podcast provider and on the YouTubes. But That's if what you, you think say. our show is worth anything more than the time it takes to listen to it, and if you want to show your appreciation, you can buy us next week's coffee by going to ko-fi.com. That's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. You can also sign up to be a friend of the podcast through the same link where for as little as two bucks a month you can get a mention in the closing credits of every single episode. Woohoo! And remember, you can always support the podcast for free and get us in front of new listeners by liking, subscribing, rating and reviewing wherever you get your podcasts. Yes. No, I'm not going to say and now this because, again, we do not have a last year tonight because we were still in our holly bobs. We were. We were. We were in Phoenix. At this point, well, we we're, were in probably on the way Phoenix back. earlier. On the, this is this is around the time that our little um, hybrid gave up the ghost, and we were stuck in an Indian casino. It was like a scene from a movie. <laughs> it was like a mirage. This little town of Peyton, Arizona, yes, just appeared out of the desert. Yes, as my check engine light popped on, right, with a big ass Indian casino. That's no fun driving through. Apache, I believe. A mountainous desert road with your check engine light on. Right, with cactuses looming above. Oh, oh don't we paint a picture? We do. We do. Anyway, we will take a quick break there and we will be right back with <gasps> this week's recap. We're back. We forgot to mention our anniversary. Our <laughs> anniversary was this week. Too late now. Oh, well. Shall we dive in, <laughs> my dear? Here I was saying we had such a shit week. And yet it was our anniversary. Yes, please. You can read into that whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> our <sighs> anniversary was lovely. It was. It was gorgeous. And you have excellent taste in gifts. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Our first storyline tonight is Red Hot Chili Papers on Monday. That chili thing that they mentioned last week. Remember that chili thing that they mentioned last week? When yes, I do. Bernie got some chili in her eye and all that mm, sort of stuff. Yes. And Gemma came up with this great idea. Well, apparently, it's a thing. It is a thing. And it's happening. Yeah. Right now. Right now. With only three contestants. Gemma has taken delivery of lots of chilies and in increasing Scoville ratings. The winner is whoever can eat the hottest chili. But let's not forget, it's all about raising money for Paul. So I was kind of right. It's whoever can eat the, the hottest one. Yeah. It's going to be Chesney, Shona and Dev going head to head because sure, who gives a fuck? Why not? These are the people who are in that day. Right. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dev is showing off his new hot stuff t-shirt. Was it a poo on his shirt? What was on his shirt? It was a chilli, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah. I kept thinking it was a poo. A poo or a poo? <laughs> not a poo from The Simpsons. Okay. A poop of that. A poopy. Reminded me of that uh, Outcast <laughs> song again. <laughs> Rosie really smell like poo-poo. <laughs> they released that. People bought it. Yes. 
Anyway, Dev's got his Hot Stuff t-shirt on at the garage and is looking for sponsorship. Gemma has everything prepared at home and warns Joseph to stay away from the super hot chilies. Joseph wants to go to a summer club, but Chesney tells him that they have no money because they never have any money. No, Gemma even said, though three people are working in that household. Gemma says that she'll ask for more shifts at the Rovers, but Chesney worries that she's already stretched herself too thin. Well, I say worries. Mm. She's picking up an extra 60 quid a day times two every time she's looking after uh, Bertie and Glory. Mm-hmm. But I don't know how long she's been doing that for because, right, because we kind of she's saw also, it and then we never see it again. Right. And she's also like working two other jobs during the day. I don't know how all of this fits in. Right. And I think that's part of the problem. Yes. Bernie goes round to see Paul, who isn't feeling up to the chilli contest as he's been rejected for a job in a call centre. Bernie fakes a coughing fit and as she's going for a glass of water, she plants more crystals, except this time Paul catches her. Exhausted about complaining, he lets her plant some more stones, even though these aren't his beliefs, but it makes her feel like she's doing something positive. Yeah, and they're not all crystals, because hematite is not a crystal. It's a stone, it's a mineral. Say what you like about the bistro. It puts on a great chilli eating contest at short notice. Apparently. There are ten chilies ranging from Poblano to the Carolina Reaper. Woohoo! Dev and Shona talk trash to each other. Well, Chesney says that he sweats when he eats a glacier mint. Munchers, let's get munching. Hmm, no comment. By seven chilies, <laughs> Chesney is that's what she said. bright red and Dev can see through time. It's a ghost <laughs> pepper that's up now and afterwards from Summer and Kev, Paul can't stand the fact that people are feeling sorry for him so he excuses himself and leaves. And then they move on to the Nada Viper but Dev just can't handle it. Chesney can't even face looking at it. And Shona, who has been shot in the stomach, let's not forget, successfully eats it and is declared the winner. But at what cost? Well, she was shot in the stomach, but it only damaged her brain. Sure. Paul comes back just in time to see Bernie count the donations and Dev throw up in a bucket. And Kirk just eats a Carolina Reaper like it's nothing. They've raised 800 quid, which Bernie stuffs in an envelope in Paul's jacket pocket so that the rest of the story can happen. Right, yes. Now, those peppers were made out of sugar. They were, we saw on the Twitter. Yeah. While Twitter was still a thing. It's still a thing, kind of. Yeah. Pl- yeah, just a, a confectioner, a baker made them. Yeah. Made quite a few of them. Right. You wouldn't have noticed. No, no. They looked really good. They did a good job. Yeah. I think maybe they went a little overboard with the makeup, with the making them look sweaty and flushed and hot and stuff. Oh, just, I thought that sold it. Yeah. That helped to sell it for me, I thought. You never see people on Hot Ones get that hot and flushed. I guess they're celebrities. They're different. Celebrities sweat differently, they do. They do. They glow. On the way home, before Gemma heads off to her job, because she's done all this today... And, and now she's she has still to go to her to job. She and Paul chat about the event. He wishes people wouldn't treat him differently and wishes that he could go back to a time before illness, kids and work. And he goes home leaving Gemma feeling pretty down in the dumps. At home though, Paul isn't about to get a break because Billy and Bernie are arguing about which is best, crystals or Christ. Billy is team Christ, but Bernie reckons Christ had a chance and did fuck all, so it's time for a fancy wee stones to get their turn. Paul is fucking furious about this and storms out. The way that they argued, yeah. Billy and Bernie, yeah. was not convincing in the slightest. No. Bernie just seemed to be nitpicking at Billy right. without cause. Right. And suggesting that, well, you've had your chance, Mr. Know It All. Right. When, to be fair, Billy can be that guy. Right. But it hasn't been that guy in the storyline, really. I don't well, think so, yeah, anyway. Well, yeah, except for the whole baptism thing. And also, Paul is Bernie's son. I'm sure she's had crystals around him his whole life, and that didn't save him from a disease that's going to kill him or a rapist. So maybe the crystals aren't working either. Yeah. It's such a weird argument because crystals aren't necessarily a religion. It's just belie- believing in the healing. It's like, it's like I was going to say, it's kind of like believing that sage can, can cleanse 
the air, but sage can cleanse the air. Get your tin foil out, people. We're going deep. <laughs> it's not a religion. Crystals aren't a religion. I don't they're think a, anyone's saying that it is. They're a thing. Well, her whole argument is that you have your faith and I have mine. Well, she believes that crystals work. Right. That's her faith. But it's kind of a false equivalency. However, Billy is obnoxious saying that they're just superstition. And it's like, they're rocks, Billy. It's it's not like she's sacrificing a goat in the backyard. <laughs> no. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Maybe they should try that. <laughs> Maybe they should. <laughs> That's my, my goat impression. It's. <laughs> I was based on a sheep. Right, yeah. It should be that goat that gave you poison ivy. Billy says you can't compare a superstition to an organised religion, and I'm sure there are lots of people in the world who would say, yes, you can. Well... You can you can very much do that. Yeah, but, I mean, it, I feel like it would be more interesting if, like, she was an actual... If she was, like, pagan or something, something that is another organised religion... Hmm. You know, an actual faith instead of just flighty hippie lady. You know, Mm -hmm. it feels like that would be a more interesting argument to be having. Do you know, it's almost like that they just have to have them at loggerheads about something so that Paul would leave. Right. Yeah. And, and, And the method in which they got them at loggerheads to get Paul to leave wasn't really thought through that well. Right. Yeah. Because let's remember, for the longest time, we had forgotten that Bernie was a hippie. Right. Especially since she grew up in the in the 90s. She's she's Gen X like us. So it's not like she was born in the 60s. So Paul winds up at the Rape Hotel where he runs into an old flame, Zach. Ooh. It seems Zach is under the impression that Paul dumped him and never returned his calls. And looking at them, I think maybe that went the other way. <laughs> Paul insists that he's an innocent man here. I'm so glad I wasn't the only one thinking that. And buys, buys haughty Zach a pint, explaining that he didn't call back because he was in jail. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> the chat continues with Paul's dimples working overtime. It turns out Zach is working at the hotel as a plumber and has a room key. And but after not like that. lots of to and fro, Paul wants to go to Canal Street, old school homosexuality. But instead, Zach talks him into going up to the room. And they're no Where sooner he has there some pipe to lay. than to do a jobby. Because that that's what that means. <laughs> that's not always what that means. There are other pipes, so to speak. They don't lay it, though. You lay it in and, something. Anyway, they're no sooner <laughs> there than Zach his... tries to smooch Paul, but he points out that he has a boyfriend. He loves with his boyfriend. He loves his boyfriend. He doesn't cheat. And he definitely didn't shove Mike. Zach, and yet he doesn't mention any of this until they get up into the bedroom. And they're winching, right? Right. Zach pretends to be fine with this, but when Paul dishes out the miniature from the mini fridge, Paul gets wired into it, but Zach pours his away. Right, because earlier Paul went to the bathroom and Zach noticed the envelope full of cash in his jacket because, of course... He still has that envelope of cash in his jacket. So that this can happen. Yeah, he didn't put it away. Yeah. Oh, God, no. 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 Much later, when a frantic Billy is trying to call him, Paul has passed out on Zach's bed while Zach nicks the 800 quid from Paul's jacket and leaves. He fucks off. I know. Paul is really testing the limits of my sympathy here (laughs) because I do feel sorry for him. Right. To an extent. But in this moment, it's like, you, you're your own worst enemy here. It's, there's nothing that anyone's going to be able to do that's going to help you out here because you're going to fuck it up. Now, is that Paul's fault? Or is that the fault of the writers who keep writing him this way? Well, is this in character for Paul? It, it kind of is. Yeah, but it's kind of like, the whole stealing the car from the dead guy thing. It's like, I think we have enough content without adding to it, especially since this kind of turns into a nothing burger by the end. And, you know, I expect a double deluxe nothing burger several times Mm -hmm. between now and whenever this 
this storyline starts to to pick up and gain some pace because the drama between now and then isn't really very much mm-hmm. as Paul slowly deteriorates. Right. Makes plans for his bucket list and his funeral and all that stuff before right. he starts to get really sick. Yeah. So they have to do stuff in the meantime to maintain some interest in this. Right. And that's why I think bits like this exist is to... Because nothing, nothing would be happening. But again, do they? Because we had the whole chili thing and that was fun and it caused conflict in that Paul is uncomfortable with people being sympathetic to him. We have the conflict of Bernie and and Billy, you know, fighting about their faith. And it's always good when Billy remembers that he's a Christian and that's when he said to Bernie, runs a church. I'm not going to have a, a theological debate with you. Right. I'm like, please, Billy, please, please, please have a theological please. debate with somebody. Right. We would like to see you actually do your job. <laughs> it's just, it seems like the writers don't know what your job is. Right. Because you keep on thinking that he's a vicar or a bishop. He's an archdeacon. There you go. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. I don't think it's... I don't think it's necessary to take yeah. it to this extent, but I think writers think that. Right, yeah. Because, it, yeah, there's enough to mine here about the concept of a young person knowing they're going to die and what are they going to do with the time that they have left. But you know what they could also do? They could give Paul a break and write storylines for other characters for a while. Yeah. And just like... Have him slowly dying in the background. Which, which seems to be happening for somebody else this week. Right, yeah. And, you know... And maybe they'll do that. And it's also kind of tough because there were moments in the storyline where it seemed like Peter Ash forgot that he's not supposed to be able to use one of his arms <laughs> and one of his hands. Does it, Does he have good days and bad days? I was kind of giving them the benefit of the doubt with that. Maybe there's good days and bad yeah. days. Well, when... Later on that day, he seems to remember, and and his his hand is not working again. I was kind of like, okay. <laughs> but when he's like, friend, you, you leave Peter Ash alone. He's doing a grand job. For the most part, yes. I I'm, and like I said, I'm more mad at the writers than I am at Peter. Yeah. So I'm splitting the stories off at this point. We'll come back to Gemma, and we're going to focus on Paul for the next couple of days, not literally. On Wednesday, Bernie goes round to the holy flat with a fig leaf or something that she stole from somebody's garden. She thinks Paul is still asleep there, but Billy thought Paul was with Bernie. Bernie realises that Billy doesn't like fighting and confrontation and tells him not to take Paul's reaction so personally. They both apologise for their stupid fucking behaviour yesterday. Yeah, Bernie is actually quite insightful in this moment, asking him if his parents fought a lot, Mm. if he, he grew up in a household with lots of confrontation. But see, I think Bernie probably grew up in a household with lots of confrontation. Right. And Paul and Gemma certainly did. Well. And they're currently in a household with lots of confrontation, so. Yeah. Billy's been kind of gone one way with that, I guess. And right. And just hates it. And then Paul and Gemma just, just let it all hang this, out. This is how people who love each other behave. Right. Meanwhile, Paul is waking up in the hotel room. Zach has gone and he has fifty missed calls on his phone and wouldn't you Adam and Eve it? The money's gone from his jacket pocket. He tries to call Zach, but the number has already been disconnected hmm. because that's how telecommunications works. Very quickly. Bernie, Billy and Gemma are on the street looking for Paul while Paul wanders round the corner anyway. Yes. He tells them he's hanging and needs a bacon butty. Everyone apologises to everyone else apart from Gemma. Paul says that he slept on the mate's sofa after too many shots, so they go to the mm. rover for more booze. Billy tells Paul that dog. he and Bernie have been insensitive to Paul. Paul says he doesn't want to feel like they're patient. He's their fella and son, respectively. And that's how we'd like to keep it for as long as possible. So Billy goes to the bar and comes back with some exciting news. There's a stair lift on Craigslist going cheap, and he reckons that they should make an offer with that wedge Paul got yesterday. Gulp, says Paul. Yes. Back home, the stair lift has been snapped up by somebody else. Aww. Billy wants to deposit the cash in the bank, which is what Paul should have done yesterday. But Yay. Paul snaps at him. Give it a rest for a fucking minute, would you? 
Billy doesn't react and says he's going to offer a stroll, which probably means he's going to head to the pub. But Paul stops him and admits that he was necking an old flame at the rape hotel last night, but nothing else happened because he loves Billy. And the worst of it is, though, the bloke nicked the 800 quid. Okay, now you can go on your stroll. <laughs> but Billy, he's <laughs> and furious now. Yeah. He accuses Paul of going to the room with the intention of cheating and has no idea if Paul is telling the truth anymore. He's only confessing now because Billy put him on the spot. Billy knows that he gets things wrong with us, and this is hard for him too, and he's watching the man that he loves die before his eyes. And Paul wanted to get his hole off someone else, so cheers for that. Billy heads out, not knowing if he's leaving for good. When Benny It's c- your flat, so Billy! Flat, no. <laughs> Benny comes in and accuses Billy of being on his high horse for still being angry at Paul for staying out all night, so Billy explains that he's angry because Paul tried to get his hole off of an ex and lost all the charity money. Now stick that up your hole, you witch, says Billy. And he storms off. And after a beat, Bernie shouts at Paul to get on his feet. You're coming with me. Right, yeah. See, she's actually... Doing she's something. She's actually doing something. Right. Right, you. Let's go. We're right. going to go find that money. I, th- I thought that was great. That was great. At that moment, I think, do you know there's a chance that they're going to get this money back? Right. So they go to the rape hotel to quiz Debbie about Zach the plumber. But Zach's work is done. And the number that she has for him is the number that Paul's got. Well, that's that idea fucked. Meanwhile, Billy is at the bistro spilling Paul's dirty laundry to Toya, who is still serving behind the bar. Toya reckons Billy should forgive Paul for being flirty and drunk and reckless, just like she did before she killed Imran. (laughs) Embrace the time that you have together, she says. Yes, because you never know when you'll intentionally run into a building and kill your husband. That's right. All the best therapists work behind the bar. That's actually probably the best place for Toya. Probably. The, so much better mm. than the Knicker Factory. Oh, God, yeah. I'll complain about that in another storyline. Yay. So Paul goes back to the pub with Bernie when Deus Ex Machina walks in. It's Zach. Bernie locks the doors. No gut leaves, shouts Begby. But Zach has come with the money, minus 80 quid, that he spent on none of your fucking business. He read it in the paper because Zach reads the paper about the chilli contest and Paul's MND, and if he'd known about it, he wouldn't have stolen the money. Right. Paul that's, seems that's big of you. Paul, that's, that's big of you to say, I wouldn't have stolen your money if I knew you were dying. But if you weren't dying, I would have kept it. Paul almost seems reluctant to take the money back as it's done out of pity. So Bernie snatches it from Zach. Thank you very much. Paul apologises and tells Zach not to worry about the 80 quid. It's his penance. Zach has no idea what he's talking about. And that's the end of that. Yeah, so a big old nothing burger. Mm -hmm. Because he just came to the pub anyway. Right, he just, yeah. So literally if Paul had done nothing and told nobody, Zach would have come back and given him the money. Well, he would have had to have found out where he lived. He read it in the paper. All of this that he read in the paper. Right. But he came into the, the rovers. Paul doesn't live in the rovers. Well, how does he know where he lives? He doesn't. He knows where he, he knows so, the town he lives so, in, but he doesn't. I so, hope but, the newspaper but what didn't I'm post saying, his address. What I'm saying is that nothing that Paul did afterwards no. had any effect on no. whether he was going to get his money back or not. Right. Him. Yes. So, yes. So he could have just kept his mouth shut not confessed anything. Right. And he was still got the money back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Big but old nothing burger. Maybe he should have done that. Yeah. Yeah, especially since he did not have sex with Zach because he's an idiot. He did winch him though. Yeah, but that was more on Zach. Zach didn't ask. He just took. Zach's of the world do that. They do. Especially that Zach Morris. He's trash. He is trash. <laughs> Jake Morris is trash. <laughs> oh, yeah. I wonder if they still do that. I, don't I used to love that. You did. You oh. also used to love Big Bang Theory, though. So And Young Sheldon. Zach Morris is trash, though, only lasted for like five, six minutes. So, do you think? Right. Yes. So, Paul goes to see Gemma with an all's well that ends well story, but Gemma is furious at Paul's stupidity and she tells him to get his arse back home to beg for forgiveness and explain what's going on in his head. Billy deserves the truth. Paul asks Gemma to promise to always be honest with him. Which is nice. So Paul 
goes and does that. He goes home and explains that his head's a mess and that every time Billy talks about baptism, he's talking about Paul's soul. And that means thinking about the day that Paul is no longer there and Paul is not ready to think about that yet. He's afraid. And Billy threatens him by saying that he's not going anywhere and he will be with him every step of the way. <laughs> and they hold hands and tearfully look dead ahead. On Friday, Nina rolls. Billy wants to talk about the big questions of the day, what to have for dinner. Paul is worried that Billy is masking his true feelings, but Billy says all that was sorted unless Paul wants to pick up the scab some more. Oh no, no thank you very much. Back at God HQ, Bernie drops off some of Paul's washing. Is Bernie doing Paul's laundry now? Well, he can't do it because he only has one working well, hand. Well, Billy can do it. And Paul is loving with Billy. Right. I don't know. Does Billy do his own washing? Does well, if Summer he doesn't, does who it? does that? Summer? Does Bernie do Billy's as well? God, I hope not. I hope not. Nobody, nobody wants to touch the holy knickers. <laughs> Paul is thinking about getting Billy a gift to say thank you for ignoring the cheating and the stupidity. Bernie asks what Billy likes, and Paul has no idea. He likes God. Bernie suggests a big statue of Jesus, and this gives Paul an idea. Paul rushes into Nina's roles to see Billy and announces that he really wants to get baptised after all to apologise for cheating on Billy <laughs> and for being so stupid that he lost 800 quid of charity money. Billy thinks that maybe he's doing this for guilt. Paul says it's not just that, it's also to prove that he loves Billy. Aww. But remarkably, this still doesn't wash that well with Billy, who thinks that something like a vague interest in God is required before he can get behind the baptism idea. Instead, he thinks maybe Paul would be better spending his time talking to some people who know what they're talking about with motor neuron disease and slides over a leaflet about a support group. You and your leaflets, says Paul, and he promises to think about it. Right. And that's as far as we get with that this And week. then we get a delightful story from Sally about when one of the girls got baptised at 15, where she got fully dunked by a pastor, <sighs> who cares? which means Sally does not go to Billy's church. Sally is Protestant. Oh, I don't think well, she's religious Protestant. at all. Well, they're all Protestant. Huh? I don't think she's religious at all, but Sophie was. That's true. Sophie was. She was also a lesbian. That's right. She still is. She's still a Christian and a lesbian. Why? Why did we lose such an interesting character? She also had a lovely denim jacket, if you remember. She did. I loved that denim jacket. I love that denim jacket more than you love Sarah's leather skirt. Really? It's <laughs> quite a lot. I love to see you in Sarah's leather skirt. <laughs> well, wow. I have a breathe in, maybe. <clears throat> so, thoughts on this storyline this week? I should get you a leather kilt. Uh, yeah. Uh, stop it. <laughs> this family has been through enough. Can we maybe just focus on... The interesting aspects of knowing you're going to die and storylines about that without adding on to it, especially if it's all just going to resolve itself in one episode. Yeah, and I didn't appreciate the testing of my sympathy. I really want to be sympathetic to Paul. Mm -hmm. I think it's a horrible disease. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And I hope it does a lot of good for, for people who are going through similar things, but Having this kind of aspect to it isn't right. really helping any, no. anybody as far as I can see. No. And it's making me lose a little bit of interest in the storyline because right. it's just Paul fucking up again. Right. How many times do we need to see Paul fucking up because right. of this? Yeah. I think I've, I've had my fill of it. Yeah. The car thing was bad and bad enough. And it was bad. It was bad. It was terrible. And this... You give him 800 quid just so he can lose it? Right. I mean, the whole bumping into an old flame and cheating because you know you're going to die and and you're a little bit reckless because you're going to die. Mm. That I didn't mind. But having the guy that you're cheating with then also steal $800 off of you for no real reason. Because he got dumped. I guess it's revenge for getting dumped. But that apparently happened years ago. Yeah, plus look at him. Right. Look at you, Zach. Yes. This, didn't, this was a blip in your morning. Right. 
And he's a freelance plumber. The world needs more of those. He's rolling in money. Right. Plumbers make lots of money. <laughs> rolling in money. Not and too, poo. Not too... Not too shabby to look at. No. <laughs> the world is, is Zach's oyster. Right. So why he needs 800 quid? He got, probably got paid two grand for that job. Right. In cash under the table by Debbie. Right. That's why she hired a freelancer. That's the only reason why she would hire a freelancer. Yeah, because she has no details on them apart from a, a phone number that doesn't work. Right. Yeah. And he was partially paid with a room for the night. <laughs> well, plum for accommodation. <laughs> That's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. <laughs> I didn't really like the, the Billy and Bernie thing, as I mentioned earlier, but I did like them making up. And I much prefer Bernie when she's agreeable or when when her when her enemy is my enemy. And, right. And Billy wasn't really my enemy in that. No. I don't really mind Paul cheating on Billy because I don't think they should be together in the first place. No, no, <laughs> so, absolutely not. So there's no harm, no foul there. Right. But, I don't know, just just quit it. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. With that, with that stellar critique, Yes. let's move on to our next storyline, which is Tim's mum about the house. Another storyline to which I would like to say, quit it! <laughs> On Monday. What the hell? Oh, yeah. Where do we start? <laughs> On Monday, that's where we start. Yes. Carla is already calling Stephen early doors, presumably with the seagull thing. He dingies her, and then he and Tim's mum run into Jerry, who runs the Tai Chi classes, and announces that the classes will be continuing because they've been such a success. Tim's mum invites Jerry to join them for breakfast at Nina Rolls. So at breakfast, Jerry and Tim's mum are jabbering about how great Tai Chi is when Carla comes in. All right, Bob Ags, she screams. Stephen hurries over and explains that the consultant couldn't make it today because, remember, Carla wants a meeting with a seagull person so she can talk about what work they've been doing for the knicker factory. Mm -hmm. Carla is unimpressed, so Stephen has to tell her that he will be able to set up a video call today, but clearly he has no idea what he's going to do. At the factory, though, he gets Sarah out of the way by telling her that Audrey is unwell or dead or whatever. <laughs> and once that's done, he calls his ex, Gabrielle. What? What shite have you got yourself into now, she asks. And he fills her in. But not like that. And gets her to agree to pretend to be a seagull consultant. How? Which... What is this relationship they have with one another where he asks her to do illegal batshit crazy stuff and she's just like okay person who has already swindled me out of money mm -hmm. i will help you swindle other people out of money they seem to have that sort of i'm going to say toxic relationship with each other don't they it doesn't make any sense why she would agree to this has she helped him out before i kind of yes. have the feeling that she has she impersonated audrey in order to get that reverse mortgage that's right she put on a voice. She put on a old oh, lady voice. Good evening. My name's Audrey. <laughs> but, <laughs> but at least, but at least that was so that he could pay her back. Yeah. She was at least getting something out of that. Why he would even have the audacity to ask her to do this? He doesn't know anybody else. It's a, literally the only other person he knows. Who will do evil with him? No, just the only other person that he knows. He doesn't know anybody. He knows people on the street and Gabrielle. And that's it. Aren't there other people who used to work for him somewhere? Give me a name. Doesn't he have friends in Canada? No. He has friends in Canada. They sent him videos of Canada Day. He sent them himself. <laughs> anyway, he says he's going to make it worth a while. Later, she has a meet with Carla and does a decent job of speaking consultant tease. And Carla is convinced, but tells Stephen there will be no more business with Siegel from now on. Meanwhile, after Tai Chi, Jerry is so impressed that Tim's mum could get her leg that high. Eh? And invites her for a no hito, and she'll be back before Stephen gets home from work. She's in two minds, but agrees. But Stephen is at home, and he's congratulating Gabrielle on her deception. Gabrielle has no idea why he's investing so much time for so little reward. Right. Voice of the audience. Yes. Stephen insists that he still has his eye on the prize, just as Tim's mum comes in, 
and he quickly cuts a call with Gabrielle to the extent that Tim's mum becomes suspicious. What right. were they talking about? Yes, and yet the prize is the Knicker Factory. Is it still the Knicker Factory? What else would it be? If Tim's mum's flat. It's his flat too. His name's on the mortgage, isn't it? Or the lease or whatever. I don't think so. Hmm. Later, to distract Tim's mum from this weirdness, Stephen says that he no longer wants to invest in the factory. Instead, he wants to get the paperwork together so the two of them can get married as soon as possible. Oh, Stephen, says Tim's mum, successfully distracted. Yes, well, she says it, but she says it in a way where she's not quite sure she wants to marry him anymore because uh, of Tai Chi guy. I'm not sure. I, I think... don't know. Her face, her face was kind of like, why today of all days? When I have been successfully wooed by a nojito. No, I, I think she was uh, swept off her feet a little bit here again. Mm. On Wednesday, Stephen is in Nina Rhodes with his favourite woman, Tim's mum and his mum. <laughs> He's arranged for the two of them to go wedding shopping. It's all very light-hearted, but as soon as Tim's mum heads to the counter to pay, Stephen starts acting with Audrey like Tim's mum has been sold down in the dumps recently. Audrey agrees now that she thinks about it, reckoning that Tim's mum was putting on a show a little bit too much. Back from town, they all run into Tim. Because who, who would be happy about marrying Stephen? <laughs> they all run into Tim, who isn't pleased to see that they didn't use streetcars. Tim's mum says that they are wedding prepping and they're going to have a date soon. Tim tells them to stick their date up their arse. Right, right up, up their, their arse. arse! Telling Tim's mum that Stephen was nothing to her five minutes ago. Back home, Tim's mum is distraught. Stephen suggests writing Tim a letter to let him know exactly how she feels, making sure to say that she can't take it anymore, no more can she take it, and to say that she's really lonely, and to sign off by saying, goodbye, cruel world. <laughs> Tim's mum doesn't think he'll read a letter, which, because it's Tim. But Stephen says he that... Can now Tim, Stephen says that we've had that storyline Stephen says he'll give it to Tim in front of Sally to make sure that he takes it Tim's mum agrees and goes to get her writing stationery out Stephen takes a letter to the factory and folk copies it and then takes the original to Tim's house the two of them argue on the doorstep with Stephen calling into question Tim's relationship with Sally and seemingly going out of his way to wind Tim up hmm. and it works and Tim slams the door in Stephen's face and the tail end of this is caught by Sally who sees Stephen suddenly being reasonable as soon as her head appears around the door. So Stephen goes home and explains how it went to Tim's mum. Tim's mum takes the letter back and rips it up and throws it in the garbage saying if Tim wants a war, he's going to get a war. Isn't it convenient that uh, Tim's mum did that? tore up that letter and threw it away. So very convenient. So now with the letter destroyed, no one apart from Stephen being aware that it ever existed, and with Sally seeing Tim being an asshole and Stephen being reasonable, Stephen goes back to the factory, being sure to take out the garbage on his way, and uses a light box, he starts to trace key phrases from Tim's mum's letter. Right. Writing, writing her suicide letter for her. How nice of him. I think what this makes it premeditated. What a ridiculous storyline this is. American soaps have occasionally had things like chimpanzees and aliens in them. This is more ridiculous than that. No. This is more ridiculous than a chimpanzee. Now, if it was a chimpanzee suicide letter, <laughs> you might be onto something. <laughs> On Friday, Dr. Gadassa is taking a break from misdiagnosing serious ailments and refusing to order blood work. And it's in Nina Rolls where Tim tells her that she smells lovely. She's quickly accosted by Stephen who wants a word with her about Tim's mum's depression, claiming that she's suicidal now. Gadas tells him to come over to the surgery at lunchtime for a chat. In the factory, Sally apologises for Tim's behaviour the other day to Stephen and suggests a meal at the bistro to patch things up. Stephen doesn't think that Tim's mum wants to put herself in that kind of tense situation and he plants more seeds that Tim's mum's suicidal. He tells Sally not to say anything to Tim, though. But Sally immediately Sally. tells Tim. Yes. And tells him in the pub and tells him how Stephen is worried about Tim's mum's depression. Tim isn't surprised living with Stephen. Sally thinks Tim is contributing to this and warns him to wind his neck in. So later, Stephen goes to tell Gadass about horribly depressed and suicidal Tim's mum. Gadass obviously can't do anything until Tim's mum comes in herself, but says Stephen is welcome to come back anytime. And he doesn't look put out by this at all. I think he's just 
doing this to He's again sowing the plant seeds. the seeds, right? right? Tim's mum runs in to Tim on the street. She says that she hasn't the energy to fight and doesn't want to hear another word about Stephen. It's sending her blood pressure through the roof. She tells him that he needs to apologise, not to her, but to Stephen. So Stephen gets home and he's, oh, hi, honey, I'm home. Yeah, so gross. <clears throat> oh, and he's disappointed to see Tim, who suggests burying the hatchet and apologises for yesterday. Stephen understands that Tim just lost it the other day. This passes for being gracious in Tim's mum's book, and uh, she's glad that they've kissed and made up. Hold your horses, says Stephen. I'm not going to be sucking on Tim's balls anytime soon. And everyone just lets that pass without comment. Right. And that's as far as we get with that this week. Not only is he deplorable, but now he's added passive homophobia into the mix. Well, as far as my notes are concerned, yes. Well, no, because he does say, oh, we're not going to go that far. Men kissing men. Ha, ha, ha. No, well, I guess. Yeah, I guess he does a bit. He does. Now, I'm wondering if this throws a wrench into his plan here a little bit, that I, Tim is I believe apologetic. it does. I believe it does. And I'm not sure why. Well, because it means Tim is now back in the picture. Well, that does complicate and, things for him, right? Yeah. And it and it does, and it means that Tim's mum is probably going to mention to Tim that she wrote him a letter. Ooh, yes, yes. Now, remember, I think that Stephen needs to kill Tim's mum before the month is out. Otherwise, or at least try. Otherwise, the life insurance lapses. Right. Because He's, Seagull isn't going to be paying right. anything else. So. He's going to try. I do not think he's going to be successful. No. Because... For reasons that we've talked about multiple times. Yes. Does this mean that he's finally going to get caught and be off the show? So So, we don't have to look at him anymore? (laughs) So does the question really become not who is he going to try and kill? Why is he still here? It's who's going to find him out. Right. And it could be anybody. It's going to be Gary. Going to be fucking Gary. It's always Gary. Because like knows like. Murder is Because we've got to do as much as we can to rehabilitate Gary because everyone needs to forget that he kind of killed Rana. Right. And he very much killed Rick the Chin. Nobody cares about Rana anymore. Nobody cares. All her family is dead. dead. Imran's dead. Nobody gives a shit. Right. Yeah. It's... It's yeah, and and uh, and selfish, selfish Kate is gallivanting <laughs> in Asia somewhere, right? And Kate couldn't Dine, even be bothered to show up for her father's funeral. Dining at the Y with Sophie and her jean jacket. Mm-hmm. Bring Sophie back, <laughs> but not Kate. Yes, yeah. selfish, selfish Kate. Selfish, selfish Kate. Just an awful, awful character. <laughs> <laughs> Quite popular with some people, I'm led to believe. Right. Nobody in this room, though. No. I'm still enjoying this. I'm sorry. It's it's still good fun for me. The machinations of this just getting so ludicrous now. We started off with just little... Li- it's the little lies of you know, what happened to... Cinco Leo and what happened to Cinco Leo's dad and it's all just snowballed and snowballed and a lot of it has re- really relied on people not talking to each other about what Stephen said to them if you got enough people in the room to just compare notes about Stephen this thing would be solved well, in minutes I mean you would think because he had to lie to Sarah about Audrey in order to get Sarah out of there. And she comes back and she says, Grand's fine. She has no idea what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. She oh, said she didn't talk to you. too much. Right. But somebody, somewhere, has got to put these things together. Gail almost figured it out. Remember when Gail almost figured it out? Mm-hmm. Somebody's, Jenny will figure it out. Jenny and Owen. Jenny Since and Owen, Owen is still in the picture. And the ghost of Johnny. We'll, we'll figure this out. <laughs> and, and Johnny's imaginary cat. <laughs> the final clue will be hidden in the chili con carne. But without, without rice. rice. Without rice, though. 
Yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying Tim being so belligerent and refusing to refusing to play nice and basically just being an asshole to Stephen is is great. Right. But it is nice that once he realize once he sees how it's affecting his mum, he swallows his pride a little bit. Well, he said this before. It right. Didn't last. But. Yeah. You know, but he can be suspicious. Maybe it's Tim who will figure it out. <laughs> well, so. Maybe Tim will be walking by the canal and say, that looks familiar. I'm going to pull that out of the canal. Oh, my God, there's a body in here. It better not end like that. It better not be just somebody luckily walking down the canal and finds that. that it's trunk. not that deep. Somebody must have seen it and complained to the council by but, now. But they haven't. So they can't suddenly do it now. That is Deus Ex Machina. It needs to be Gary. I'm sorry. There's, there's no other explanation. It's not really Deus Ex Machina because it is something that's part of the story already. It's not, you know, just something random, like a king just walking in and yeah, resolving but, everything. But the for randomness everybody. comes from finding it now, and in, in the month before he's due to kill Tim's mum. Yeah. The timing of it. Well, let's remember how long it took to find Rick the Chin. And how that was just kind of, oh, we're just happening to dig this field up to build a pitch. Yeah, I hate that shit. It, it makes it sound like it's not been planned. And I like to think that a little bit more thought goes into it than that. Really? Moving on. Our next storyline is Bantermeister Ryan. It's such good part. On Monday, at Carla's Ryan catches wind that the sailor factory in another storyline has fallen through and becomes concerned that he's not pulling his weight and all those hoodies aren't washing themselves for free. She tells him that there's no panic, but if he wants to get back to work, maybe he should speak with Leanne. On the street, Ryan and Daisy are about to bump into each other, but he just ignores her and keeps on walking until she has to shout at him to stop. He says that she doesn't need to worry about him anymore, he's going to get his old job back at the bistro, so she can just let him go now and she can get on with her own life. That said, now Ryan has to get his fucking job back. So he goes to speak with Leanne, who luckily is snowed under and she welcomes him back with open arms. Surprised by this and spooked by the number of people in the restaurant, he asks to work behind the bar for the time being rather than being a waiter. Baby steps, he says. Leanne is thrilled to accept. No one makes a margarita like Ryan, and his Hawaiian is pretty good too. I'm suggesting that he makes pizza. On Wednesday, Carla is ignoring... If you have to explain the joke. Well, then you should react. <laughs> On Wednesday, Carla is ironing Ryan's bistro shirt ahead of his first shift. Just a wee soft return of one to four to ease himself in gently. Aye. Right. After getting off of the phone with Peter and telling Peter not to drown and not to get into any submersibles with billionaires. Is Peter ever coming back? Not if he gets into a submersible with billionaires. No, you don't have to repeat the joke. <laughs> Carla promises to drop in later, all casual-like, to see how he's doing. Ryan seems to be doing well, indulging in some banter with Rose, the wine distributor, over the phone. Toya is impressed with his schmoozing. This is Toya, who was senior sales advisor at the factory for a while, let's remember. Ryan is about to leave when a kid's party and a silver wedding anniversary party arrive and they're suddenly rushed off their feet. So he's a good guy and offers to stay until things calm down. And the kid's birthday party has special dietary needs. Yes. Let's not forget. Debbie is thrilled to see Ryan back. He's a brilliant waiter to the kids' party, who all seem to love him. Yes. But when Leanne passes the table, the mother asks if Leanne can serve from now on because, you know. Right. It's bothering the kids. It's and the kids are here at the kids. bistro to have fun. The kids are having fun at the bistro? Are there no Chuck E. Cheeses in England? Nope. <laughs> Leanne predictably doesn't react well and screams at the cow that Ryan is a hero. Ryan overhears the end of this and runs to the kitchen where Leanne, Toya and Debbie and an extra with a knife all join <laughs> all join him to make sure that he's okay. Ryan says that he's fine. We're never more than six feet away from an asshole, he says. Everyone goes back to work, relieved that Ryan hasn't taken it too badly, but as soon as their backs are turned, he scarpers home. And there he tells Carla that his shift was fine, it was fine, all right. But then he makes a big deal and just drops his stuff and runs into his room. And this gives Carla some pause, so she goes to the bistro and learns about what happened from Leanne. 
So she goes back home now and speaks to Ryan about it. He knows what she's going to say. The woman was a cow, don't let it put you off. And he knows that she's right, but people look at him differently and there's nothing that he's going to be able to do to stop that. He doesn't think he's ready, so Carla suggests working in the kitchen for a while. Or maybe behind the scenes or an admin. And Ryan thinks that this might be a decent idea. And while we're at it, Carla, why don't we get him to wear a bag over his head? (laughs) Fucking hell. Couldn't believe that. Well, I don't know. On Friday, Ryan goes back to the bistro and asks if he still has a job. Leanne is only too happy to see him and lets him work backstage until he gets his confidence back. Leanne says his first job can be getting a new wine deal from Rose, who has just been on the phone. And at that, Rose calls. So Leanne lets Ryan deal with it. Yes. Oh, I've described that beautifully. Yes, you have. It seems Ryan has tippity-top banter, so much so that Rose has looked him up on socials and calls him a total babe. Rose clearly has problems separating her business life from her personal life. Just a wee bit. But Leanne is very happy with the deal that Ryan has struck. On the wine, he's got 10% off. Thanks, Ryan. Yes, for being a hurry. And not only that, Rose is going to pop in later. Ryan gets into a panic at that, and Leanne apparently hadn't thought that this cost that this could possibly be an issue for him. So Ryan's about to leave, but Rose beats him to it, and she is initially surprised to see Ryan's scars, but do you know what? She covers reasonably well yeah. while Leanne waits for the ground to swallow her up. Rose calls Ryan Buns of Steel Yay. and asks for his help bringing the samples in. So Rose is kind of... Rose is all right. Kind of harassing Ryan a little bit, but, you know, yeah, it's, it's done it's in good right. jest. So. It's all right. She's, she's, not, she's not behaving like Crystal. So <laughs> I know the bar is very low. And at least I can understand what Rose is saying. Right. So later, And she has nice hair. Her hair is very rosy. So later, Ryan and Rose seem to be getting on and she asks to go out for a drink with him sometime. Ryan, though, interprets this random act of kindness as pity and knocks her back and is a bit of an asshole in the process. Just a wee bit. Which is a shame because Rose seemed all right. Yeah, Alice she seemed like, awesome. I was like, oh, yay. Let's, let's keep this one. She's and great. I know we're just going to have her until Ryan feels better about himself. And that's that's her purpose in this life, is to make Ryan feel better about himself. Right. But she seemed fun. Yeah. I was kind of, yeah, Yeah, I'd like to see more of this character, please. And if she sticks around, then we won't have a continuation of the horrible, horrible love triangle. Right. Which does not rear its ugly head this week, which is nice. So, yeah, I was kind of disappointed that it seems like we've... Maybe seen all that there is to see about Rose. Boo! Bring Rose back! Ryan gets home to find Carla reading Chit Chat. And she seems strangely into something about Rod Stewart. I thought it was a story about a woman who's, who keeps getting abducted by aliens. Yes, and singing Rod Stewart songs to her or something. I if, think the focus was the aliens, not Rod Stewart. If your alien is singing Rod Stewart songs to you... It's that Rod alien Stewart. is Rod Stewart. Yep. <laughs> I think we've solved that little mystery. Yes. So Rod Stewart is sneaking into this woman's house and singing to her in the middle of the night. I, I and also probing her. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised on either count. Rod Stewart is a filthy, filthy bugger. As most Scotsmen are. He's not Scottish! He's not Scottish! His last name's Stewart! So's Alf Stewart, and he's Australian. Well, that's okay then. Maybe got some Scottish ancestry, but <laughs> right, yeah, his his Scottish ancestor probably did a crime, and that's why he's Australian now. Oh, so that's how that happens. That's how that happened hundreds of years ago. <laughs> right. Not within living memory. Right, but how long has his family been there? It seems like a long time. Who are we talking about now? Rod Stewart, Alfie. Oh, Alf, Alf Stewart, not Alfie Stewart. Nobody calls it Alf, Alfie Stewart. Anyway, where am I? God. And now I'm thinking about Alf the Alien. <laughs> Two takes off. Impersonating Rod Stewart. Who takes off his hat. It's Rod Stewart that's underneath. They have the same nose. They do! And the same hair. And the same disregard for women's personal space. And the same taste in cats. Anyway, I think I think we have we've we've milked we've that for what it's worth. 
We've extinguished all of our Rod Stewart content. Where was where was banter like this in the first five minutes? It takes a while to warm up. So anyway, Ryan explains about being an asshole to Rose for being nice to him. He says it was out of pity, but Carla thinks maybe she likes super handsome, super funny, super cute Ryan for different reasons. Because he's super handsome and super funny and super cute. She tells him to realise he's the same person as he was before and he needs to do some hard work on himself and see past the scars. So Ryan is looking through old Insta photos of himself when Carla comes into his room. She's spoken to Michelle. Uh, she's spoken to Michelle, who has recovered from her operation, whoever that was. Right. And that... that, that. The it, operation that happened over a month ago. What is bell. wrong with I her? I can't remember. What it was. Did she what fall or something? wrong oh, with her? And she suggests that Ryan gets out of Weatherfield, go visit his mum and get his head together. So Ryan agrees. So that's what he's going to do. So that's Ryan out of it for a wee while. Because that's the end of that this week. What? And yes. This, this, is, this is what should happen. This is, yes. right, this is what should happen with a Paul storyline. Yes. Ryan's been centre stage in this story for... Weeks and weeks. Hugely traumatic thing happening to the character. A hugely traumatic arc. We get to the other side of it. But nobody wants to see Ryan having these horrible interactions with people or to be scared of these horrible interactions with people over and over and over again. His storyline here has kind of come to an end. So give him a break. He can go away. This is the stuff that they should have done for Leanne. Yes. when they refused to give her like a a day off for like three years in fairness Paul and Billy did go to Wales they did but that was only one week and then they were back they did the same for Nick and Leanne that time they went, yeah. remember they went away to live in that that uh, witness protection place yeah for a week for a week and then they had to come back because then they had to come back cause something to stop was... the papers or something like that I don't know but yeah this this makes sense that that we give the actor a little break and we give yeah. the character a little break as well. Like and the makeup artists a little break. Yeah, I felt like his scars were looking a little more raw when he was meeting Rose than they, they had been yeah, in the past. And yeah, I noticed that too, that like all of a sudden they're more noticeable again. Bit inflamed. Yeah, and it's like, are we exaggerating this so that... I think I think that's exactly what was happening. So that we, you know, so that there's something for these people to react to. Mm -hmm. the, the, I mean, that mother was ridiculous because those kids were totally fine with it. They weren't less. even they weren't even pointing or talking about it or anything. No, they were talking about weird sauces they want to put on things. Mint sauce. I'm going to put mint sauce and everything. Right. Yeah, she was totally projecting because it made her feel uncomfortable right and there she was imagining how uncomfortable other people are going to feel who could not give them two hoots right yes but she can't be the bad guy no i know so many karens like this <laughs> right. yeah <sighs> no offense to the good karens i know oh it does leave the the tension with daisy a little bit in place though doesn't it because that that bit on Monday with the two of them walking by each other. I was good for you, pal. Just keep on walking. Yeah. But. Yeah. And then we see Daisy in a healthy relationship with Daniel in another storyline later on where they seem perfectly okay and where she's being brilliant with Bertie. Does she get any closure about this, though? It kind of feels like she has some unfinished business. She needs to be forgiven by him, I think. That's yeah. what she's waiting for. And that's going to take a while. She's been forgiven by Daniel. Oh. Why did Daniel forgive her? Because she told him about the kiss. Didn't she? No, I don't think she did. I, I she think she did. was very careful not to tell him about the kiss. Hmm. I don't know. They seem like they're okay, though, right now. I mean, granted, it's because the story that they're in isn't really about them. But still, you know, we are we as the audience are seeing her in a healthy relationship and also being quippy behind the bar talking about the lack of Johns in the world, which I don't know if that's necessarily true. Was it Ian? I think I think there were no Ians christened 
or named no, she last said, year? She said John. Yeah, no, that's what she said. What I'm saying to you is, I think it was Ian's. There was no Ian's. Is Ian a really popular name? I know lots of people called Ian. I know one. And you also know him. There are no American Ians? Not many. I oh, can't. there's hundreds of them. You, you can't, can't move for Ian's in Scotland. Well. But there's no new babies getting called Ian. Ian's a nice name. I like Ian. Do you need Ian when you go got Ewan? No. If you're Scottish. You're going to go Ewan, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. Anyway, let's move on to our next story, which is Quiz of the Week. On Monday, it's Monday, which means that it's pub quiz night. Yasmin wants to go, but Stu doesn't. He doesn't like quizzes and he thinks that Roy would be better suited. No one disagrees. But somehow, Tyrone gets roped into joining their team too, and Stu still has to come along. Nina is going to babysit for Tyrone, so that's nice, isn't it, Helen? That is nice. I like that. I like that idea of Nina babysitting Hope, of Nina being a positive influence on Hope. At the quiz, it looks like there's two teams. Yasmin, Roy, Tyrone and Stu are team one. Kev, Kirk and Michael are team two. They come up with names, but I couldn't be bothered to note them down. Stu Wasn't seems determined to wind Roy up and Yasmin seems determined to wind Stu up. At the bar, Stu calls Roy Professor Yaffle a carved wooden bookend in the shape of a woodpecker from Bagpuss and says that there isn't a book in the library that Yasmin hasn't read. Stu seems to be that kind of quizzer who knows nothing and then gets upset when no one listens to his suggestions. Don't we know some people like that? We've had people like that on our team. Yeah, not for long. That's why <laughs> That's why we are a team of two and then sometimes our children. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing when we're wrong. Mm. But at least when we're wrong, we're kind of like, I don't know. But I think it's this. Also, I'm shocked they have to pay. They have to pl- pay to play trivia. Pay for the prize money, yeah. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. That is... Ab- Come to America. Our <laughs> trivia, our pub quizzes are free. You don't even have to buy it. You can buy a glass of water. And I think people at Darbs would be fine. The pub quizzes that I've been involved in in the UK are typically free. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know why they're taking five quid for this. That seems like daylight robbery. There should be a cash prize and it should entirely be coming out of the, the cash register of the, the pub. Right. Because the pub's getting more people in to, to do drinks and, as Jenny demonstrated, take their sweet time about it so people buy more drinks. Right. Somehow, Yasmin and Roy and the hangers-on win and Roy is presented with a trophy. Stu calls for a speech, even though one isn't necessary and Yasmin thinks this is Somehow cruel. Somehow they this win. This is cruel. Somehow they win. <laughs> The mm. other team was Kev, Kirk, mm-hmm. and, and Michael. Michael. And somehow they lose. Somehow they get second place. Fuck this, says Stu, and he announces that he's going home for a bath and his back hasn't been turned for more than two seconds when we hear Yasmin laughing uncontrollably at something Roy has supposedly just said. What at- could Roy have possibly said that to quickly. make Yasmin laugh? Right. Back at Tyrone's, Nina's babysitting has been a success and Hope is keen to know what bands Nina likes. Let's have a guess at how this is going to develop. I imagine Hope in two weeks' time will be wearing full goth makeup. That'd be awesome. (laughs) Nina assures Tyrone it's all PG goth music. What's a PG goth band that you know? Shakespeare's sister. All right, yeah, I'll give you that. Are they even goth? I don't know. I don't know. Sisters of Mercy. There you go. There you go. Yasmin gets home and she and Stu apologise to each other. Stu doesn't like quizzes and Yasmin says that she shouldn't have forced him into it. Stu definitely has an inferiority complex. Yes, we knew that already. And Yasmin. Yasmin says that she's a sucker for a bad boy and the two of them smooch. Yes, which is nice. That goes. Which is nice. I'm glad they have firmly established that Yasmin and Stu's relationship is strong. But, in, but I feel somewhat vindicated, at least in noticing that there was some... The show was trying to <coughs> tempt us with a little free song between Roy and Yasmin, because Stu saw it. Stu, mm. when he looked back, sees it. So I don't think it was... I don't think it was just Evelyn. 
No. That this, that this was for. But I, yeah, I'm glad that it's not a thing either. Yeah. I kind of feel like the show does do a disservice with a lot of this because he's an asshole this week because yeah and i can understand because this has come up before you know his inferiority complex and him feeling down on himself for not knowing what to do in certain situations and stuff this has come up in his his parenting of his granddaughter Mm -hmm. you know and getting her a limo for her birthday (laughs) sort of thing and it feels like it's not really addressed that an awful lot of this has to do with the trauma of his life, having been homeless and having people look down on him. Yeah, that's a good point. Constantly because of that and being falsely accused of murder and having people look down on him for that when he did not murder anybody, you know. That we know of. <laughs> so it, it feels like the show is... is giving him emotions that make sense but they're not doing anything to really explore them too much yeah and I don't it, think the show kind of feels it fe- kind of feels like it's forgotten that he has been homeless and there's a kind of there's a, a happy medium between giving us these little tidbits of his character that because like like i said this week i thought he was an asshole because he was behaving very childishly during most of the the quiz stuff like you said there's reasons for that right but those reasons are only i think noticeable when you are prepared to spend some time diving into it and thinking about it right i don't think most people would afford it that much no time or consideration so they just think well he's an asshole then right so there's I think there's something in the middle where they can right. make that like a, like a little bit more obvious. Right. Maybe Yasmin could even say something. Look, understand this aspect of your character. This makes absolute sense. But you've got to believe that I'm not doing anything that's that's right. That's to make you look stupid or feel stupid. Right. You know, just and kind of yet, address it a little bit. And yet, she was absolutely ridiculous by telling him that he was being cruel. Yes. Yes. For the for the banter of oh. Roy, you should give a speech. There are so many things that he could have said at that moment that would have been actually cruel. Right. The the comparison to Professor what's his name? Yaffle. Yeah. The carved wooden bookend in the shape of a woodpecker. Right. That's more cruel than Roy, you should give a speech for winning our award. What we're also asked to believe there though is that Roy has never won the pub quiz. Right. Has Roy never been to the pub quiz? No, he has because he was on a he was on a team. He's been on a team with Evelyn. So yeah, he should know how this goes. Although I think I'm sure Johnny gave <laughs> trophies away and didn't make people bring them back. Oh, That's Johnny. ridiculous too. Although just don't give a trophy. Don't give a trophy. Don't give a trophy. Just give the thirty dollars certificate or the thirty pound certificate, and then Jenny. The the cruel thing is Jenny conning Roy into buying drinks for the runners up mm-hmm. with his winnings. Yeah. How dare you, Jenny? How dare you? Let's ah. move on. Our penultimate storyline tonight is Adam's lunchbox. But not like that. Hey. On Friday, in Nina's roles, Adam and Sarah are having an awkward conversation about their day. Sarah is busy with meetings, so can't meet for lunch. She goes off and Daniel comes over to talk to Adam, who is having a tough time imagining Sarah sleeping with every man that she meets. Daniel assures him that Sarah could have left him a million times by now, so she must love him or something. (laughs) Thanks, Daniel. Not wrong. Adam, who doesn't work at the factory, comes into the factory looking for Sarah. He's brought her lunch. In a box. But Sarah isn't there. Stephen tells Adam that she's in a meeting with Owen at the Rape Hotel. You remember the Rape Hotel, don't you, Adam? Wait, why is she having a meeting with Owen when Owen is pulled out? But not like that. He's still involved in the Snapper deal. Oh, right. Adam gives Sarah's lunch to Beth. Adam goes to the Rape Hotel and interrupts Sarah's public meeting with Owen. Michael is there too. Nobody said Michael was going to be there. Nope. Womp womp. Adam says that he was bringing Sarah her lunch, but it's in Beth now, so thank God for good intentions. <laughs> he makes a flimsy excuse and leaves while Sarah pretends that this is perfectly normal behaviour and happens all the time. She gets home and Adam's cooking tea. Sarah says that Owen thinks that she's a victim of coercive control now. Thanks for that. 
She tells him that he needs to trust her again. She can only apologise so many times. He explains how difficult it is to imagine Damon's baby growing inside her and can't live like this much longer. Thank goodness, then, that the results of the DNA test are next week. And that's all that happens there. So the whole storyline here is just to remind us that the DNA test results are, are next week. Anything additional to add to that? No. It was hilarious when oh, Michael so yes, then. just... <laughs> It was hilarious when Michael just pops up with drinks, you know, as Adam is lunging towards a table, mm -hmm. and then he has to pretend he's not lunging towards a table, because Michael's there. Well, I don't want to interrupt you guys. Well, you you've already, already done have. It. <laughs> <laughs> I like Owen. I'm glad he is staying in the picture. If you're Adam, and you've forgiven Sarah, mm -hmm. I think part of that forgiveness is... Trusting the trust, her. right? Yeah. If you don't trust her, then you have you really forgiven, forgiven her? her? No. I don't think he has. Well, it feels like maybe he forgave her, but now he's taken that forgiveness back because it's potentially Damon's baby growing inside her. Right. Which, lovely picture to paint there, Adam. Yeah, this little mini Damon <laughs> growing, in, growing inside Sarah's belly. It's Macaulay Culkin. Ooh, it's Alf. No, remember he Rod was in that... Stewart! Get out of here! Remember Macaulay Culkin was in that movie where he was like the bad kid? I'm not talking about Home Alone. What is it called? The Bad Seed? Yes. Yes. The final storyline tonight is Gemma and the House of Medication. On Wednesday, poor Gemma is scunnered. Chesney announces that they're out of bog roll and then goes to leave and we're left wondering, if he's <laughs> we're left wondering whether he's wiped his arse or not. And and Joseph, I can't be the only person that thought that. It just, well, maybe he was the last bit. And Joseph helpfully points out that in the Victorian era they used newspapers. And Chesney and says, "Well, you might have noticed." I'm Joseph, not Victorian. I've got shite going up my back here. Well, that would be very Victorian. Gemma tells him not to forget uh, Keris's doctor's appointment, and he tells her to let him know how it went. And then he leaves, instructing them all not to miss him too much. No I worries. think she's reminding you right. so that you'll be there. Right. Later, Rita sees Gemma struggling along the street with lots of bags of groceries, so she goes round with strawberries and cream later. Rita tells her to take a nap, but Gemma is terrified that she'll never wake up if she goes to sleep now. Everything is getting on top of her again, and she's worried that she's going to put one of the kids on a heavy cycle again. Rita tells her that she's got too much on her plate. Couldn't Chesney or Bernie help out? And Gemma really is scared of stopping doing too much because if she stops, she'll cry and she'll just keep on crying. She feels the way that she did when she had postnatal depression that time, so Rita tells her to speak to Dr Gadas and get loaded up on the meds. Yay! So when Chess comes home, Gemma tells him that her depression's come back and Gadas has given her some Prozac or whatever and some antibiotics for some reason. I think that, says that, that the antibiotics are for the baby. No, no, that's just a joke. Oh, okay. Chesney says that the only reason that he didn't ask her how she's feeling about the Paul situation is because he doesn't care. No, that's not oh, no, what that's, he that's, says. That's not what he said. He says because that he senses that she doesn't want to go there. Right. Because Chesney senses things now. Yes, it's lovely. He says that he's been worried about her and they agree to keep this between themselves. On Friday. And it's actually a really beautiful kind of touching scene between the two of them. Where they say they love one another and... And Chesney seems genuinely to care about Gemma's well-being. Mm. I really liked that scene. On Friday, Gemma's asleep on the couch when Chesney gets up. It's only 1.30 in the morning. She says that she needs to tidy the place. He's worried that she's not taking her antidepressants correctly and offers to tidy the place instead. Gemma thanks him for offering to tidy up his house. Then the quads wake up and start screaming the place down. You're <laughs> nearly four now, right? Something like that, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, maybe maybe they shouldn't wake up crying every day. <laughs> then again, their father's Chesney. <laughs> it's chaos at the quad house later as Daniel drops off Betty, then Michael comes along with Glory, and Gemma looks like she's really worried about the spin cycle on the washing machine now. Meanwhile, Bernie bumps into Chesney, and he goes on about the six kids in the house, which makes Bernie suspicious that something is up with Gemma. 
So Bernie drops into the quad house and doesn't waste time in telling Gemma that she knows about the medication thing. Bernie reminds Gemma that they're family and she's there and she gives Gemma an hour off to get some relaxation time with Nina's roles. Relax, Bernie will look after the six kids. Deal. There was something nice there as well about Bernie saying, you know how you felt when Paul didn't tell you right. how he was and right. his illness and she's like this isn't the same thing this is exactly the same thing right she's like this isn't the same thing because i'm not dying right. well yeah hmm so Gemma is in nina's roles reading the paper when beth comes in and demands to know where bertie is Gemma insists everything is fine bernie is looking after them beth is furious at this as daniel is paying her and not paying that aging hippie flustered and emotional Gemma rushes home and she's in tears when she gets to the door but when she hears the noise inside she can't face opening up and she starts to cry against the wall at this point no children have been washed Bernie though has everything under control and has the kids playing the quiet as fuck game Gemma comes home still and upset Bertie loses. and explains that Beth uh, had a go at her and she thinks that Beth was right she needs to be the one that's looking after the kids all the time but what happens if Gemma needs a shite? And I get the feeling that Gemma probably shits quite a bit. <laughs> or maybe she doesn't. Maybe that's part of the problem. No, that, that woman poops long and frequently. <laughs> Bernie leaves them to it and then Gemma gets the parcel out. Do you remember the bit where uh, Gemma had a nightmare that she was washing one of the kids in the washing machine? Yes. Okay. Yes. Gemma stretches out on the couch, and when she has her eyes closed, Bertie nicks her antidepressants from her bag. Right, because her bag <coughs> is wide open, sitting on the coffee table, mm -hmm. and her antidepressants are in her bag, and Be not high up on a shelf in the kitchen. Yeah, Bernie comes in sometime later with Daisy and Daniel, and they have to wake Gemma up. Everything's fine, she says, everything's fine, except Bertie scoffed all my happy pills, and is looking pretty chill about everything, especially being Daniel's son. <laughs> Everyone panics, apart from Daisy, who suggests everyone just calms the fuck down and acts like little Fonzies, and they all head off to the hospital, Gemma and Toe, to help out with the medication question. Right. At the hospital, the nurse wants to keep Bertie in for assessment. It seems that antidepressants aren't as bad as sedatives or painkillers for a kid to eat, so Bertie is probably going to be fine. Gemma immediately starts beating herself up, but Daniel is understanding, says it's fine, everyone's learned a lesson here, and he tells Gemma to go home. Beth comes into the room later and is <laughs> furious about Gemma and wants to know if the police have been yet. Daniel insists it was an accident, Bertie's fine but Beth isn't buying it and tells Daniel about seeing Gemma and Nina's roles and things could have been very different. And this point seems to be important to Daniel while Daisy insists that maybe it would be for the best if everyone just calmed the fuck down. Right. Yes, Daisy, the voice <laughs> of reason. But it was funny that Daniel is pretty chill about his son accidentally taking medication. Mm. But he puts his... He seems to be quite upset about the idea of Bernie watching Bertie. Yes, that point really seems to stick in his craw. Right. And I thought... And Gemma drinking coffee in Nina's rolls. <laughs> it's okay that you drug my kid, but how dare you drink a cup of coffee and leave my child with your mother? Yep. Well, I'm knowingly paying you as an unregistered childminder. Right. Yeah. Back home, Bernie apologises for leaving Gemma to spark out on the sofa, which, do you know, as soon as you said that, I was like, that, yes, exactly. Why did you do that again? Well, because she had that podiatrist appointment. Because let's mm. remember how important Bernie's feet are. <laughs> Gemma thinks the childcare scam is done now, so gets ready for a shift at the Rovers. And it's, again, this is like the second time they've done this this week, where Gemma's already done something quite considerable and now has to go to work. Right, yeah. So Kirk speaks with Gemma in the Rovers. He knows about Bertie because Beth told Tyrone and Tyrone told Kirk. Gemma doesn't want Paul finding out. Then in comes Daniel, who has decided to still be a decent guy about it all, because I thought, here he comes right. to say, look, I'm really not happy with this. 
But he says that he's not going to take it any further. It's not all her fault. He knew that she was looking after a million kids, but he says that he's going to have to look for alternate childcare arrangements. And apparently, so is Michael. Right, yes. We don't get to hear Michael. No. And I don't think we actually see Glory, do we? We do. In one scene, I think. Ha. Huh. Gemma gets back to the quad house just as she gets a call on her phone. It's from social services. Someone has reported her for running an illegal baby wrangling scam and she'll be getting a visit from them tomorrow. Fucking Daniel, says Bernie. Gemma is terrified that she's going to lose her kids, her actual kids, the ones that she gave birth to in a cable car in Wales. Right. And that's how we end this week's episode. Now, is it about the illegal daycare or is it reporting her for... He was reporting her for negligence for the whole Bernie thing or Bertie thing. Well, I think the two go hand in hand with each other, don't they? Yeah, but reporting her for the illegal daycare would get Daniel in trouble as well. Well, I think it's probably going to get Daniel in trouble because I don't think one of these things comes out without the other thing coming out. Right, yeah. So so Beth is We, we assume that it's Beth, right? We know it's Beth. We know it's Beth because Beth is such a cow to Gemma this what week. What a bitch she is this week. The whole thing in Nina's roles, I was like, how fucking dare you? She's <laughs> just here sitting, having a cup of coffee, taking a break. She deserves a break. Fuck you. And it's just, it it, it just drives home that the fact that Kirk was the only thing standing in Beth's way from just being the worst person you know. Hands up who forgot that those two had split up. When I seen the two of them together in the in Nina's roles, I was like, there's Kirk and Beth. But then when he says something, she bites his head off. like, oh, that's right. Yeah, they're not together anymore. He's and- living with a mascot, whatever right. that means. <laughs> and also, let's not forget... Beth slapped a child. Oh, 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 yes, she did. Beth slapped a child and I think paid her off. Tried to pay her off, yeah. To, like, lie about it and stuff. I hope that comes back to bite her in the ass. There are relationships, that thing that you're mentioning with Kirk, that do exist where they kind of cancel each other out a little bit. Yeah. So Kirk makes Beth... A little more pleasant. Right. And maybe Beth makes Kirk a little less pleasant. You don't want to hang about with Kirk too much because Beth's going to be there. Right. Whereas now people like to hang out with Kirk again because Beth isn't there. Right. When you remove one of them from the equation, they're all just 100% them. Kirk can have friends now. He's, he's, He's at the pub quiz with Michael and Kev. Kirk can talk to other women now without without fear that Beth is going to murder them. But we loved Beth. When she was making Fizzy's, no, Gemma's dress. She didn't, didn't make Gemma's dress. Fizzy's dress. We don't give a fuck about Fizzy's dress, do we? We care about Izzy making Gemma's dress. Well, I seem to remember us quite liking Beth during that. It was nice to have Beth back, I think. Maybe that's what it was. Or Beth doing something nice for someone. Yeah, right. We didn't give a fuck about Fizzy's dress. No. It didn't have fairy lights in it. No, it doesn't. It's just you, a you boring old dress. I can't even. Uh, you say Fizz's wedding dress. I can't think of what Fizz's wedding dress looked like. There wasn't a plug in it. There was no batteries in it. It wasn't orange. It certainly wasn't orange. No. Her hair was orange. Right, yes. And she couldn't even fucking show up for her own brother's wedding. <laughs> How dare she? I'm just a little. Well, it's one of the things that you're a little concerned about that probably gets resolved very quickly next week when. Bernie is very quick to blame Daniel for this and will not be quiet in airing this disappointment. Right, and then Daniel is going to realise that Beth did this and be very angry at Beth and tell Beth she needs to retract it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, he's the dad here. He makes these sorts of decisions. So she shouldn't be. And honestly, you know, I don't know. Beth is such a bitch. Honestly, you know, I don't know. Beth is such a bitch. <laughs> let's let's put that in the show notes for this week. Yeah, it's like the only thing she cares about is Bertie, and I guess 
I can kind of understand that. I can kind of understand that because we have never seen Daniel and Bertie together for as long as we did on Friday's episode. Right. And let's remember who was doing most of the parenting (laughs) in those scenes. It was Daisy. Right. Although Daniel did do the voice. Yeah, it was quite a good voice. Yeah, it was very cute. It sounded like Harry's cunt voice. (laughs) That didn't really... It didn't at all, really. Yeah, I and uh, and again, again, here we are, shoving the Winter Browns into more misery and more. Here's the poor family on the street. We're going to take their children away now, and they're also out of bog roll. <laughs> and also, Joseph can't go to the after school thing. Because there's not enough money, even though everybody at that household has like three jobs. There was something in the um, the chili eating contest thing where Gemma said something along the lines of that Chesney needs his taste buds for the burger thing. Right. That's still happening. Yeah. Didn't Granny Linda give him some money for that? Right. Or was that I all thought for the so. wedding? And but you would think that some of that money, because it's Granny Linda, would be going to Joseph going to the after school thing. To the summer thing, yeah. 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 It's, it's almost like it doesn't matter how much money they have it's or n- earn, it's never enough. It's never enough. And yet, where does it go? It's like the show has decided these are the poor people on the street. Perpetually poor. Right. These are the perpetually poor people on the street. So we're we're not, and we're not going to explain why we've just decided. So they're the ones who are going to have the most misery and have to work the most jobs for a little benefit. Have you ever felt sorry for Dev and all this? Dev lives next door to essentially a creche. His next door neighbors all work for him. I don't feel sorry for him his, at all. His business... Because he's sleeping with one of them. His business is... So he's obviously just fine across with the it. street and round the corner. All three people that live next door are in his employ just feels... Just so weird. But he's sleeping with one of them, so it's yeah, fine. that's fine, I guess. And sometimes she spends the night... You'd think that they so would just she move would in always, together. She should always spend the night. Right, yeah. She's only next door. Right. This is like George and Eileen not living in George's house, but instead living in that house with Mary and Sean and Todd. Yeah, because Eileen loves that house so much. She doesn't. But is she it for seems, all the good memories we're feeling? Is that? She seems to hate it. <laughs> she hates it there. She hates it. She's the only one who cleans. She's miserable. Move into George's big, massive house. Just the two of you. Let's just do something. Give Gemma a break. For the love of God. Right. Seriously. Let them... Let that let, woman let, live. It's not the first time that people have won money on scratch cards. Kev's won money on a scratch card. Just let people win money on a... Let them win money on a scratch card. Just to stop this cycle of misery. Well, remember, they had the Freshco deal, and then that went south because they... Photoshopped them. Right. Those posters are still up. Hilarious. <laughs> oh, well, that was the week that was Coronation Street. Tell me, Helen, what was your moment of the week? Chesney and Gemma. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I kind of broke out in tears watching... Did you? Yeah, watching that, that scene with the two of them, and Chesney actually being really sensitive and, and kind to his wife and know, and Gemma just kind of laying it all out there you know about how she's feeling and being honest with him I thought that it was very effective and they did both did a really great job I think this was a really poor week all in all mm-hmm. I think Monday we had the chili contest and we had the quiz night mm-hmm. normally you'd have one, one or the of other them. yeah right? Well, this is this is to explain why the chili eating contest is at the bistro as opposed to oh. the rovers where it should be. As if anyone was questioning that. Everyone knows that the bistro puts on a good emergency chili eating contest at mm. short notice. But that just kind of set the, the kind of tempo for the rest of the week, I felt. 
uh, there was a lot of nothing burgers in it, um, and it it wasn't all that. I don't know. Compared with last week, you know, we were spoiled rotten last week. We had mm-hmm. some great stuff going on with Evelyn, but now th- this week I just felt it was it was very flat and just very difficult for me to get excited about anything. So the fact that we're talking about Gemma and Chesney being moment of the week makes perfect sense. Moment of the week. <laughs> Bravo. Moment of the week. Bravo. We have to give it to Chesney occasionally. Your boring moment of the week. Was it Chesney running out of toilet paper? Yes. Yes. I was going to say, it was Chesney walking down the stairs and saying they're out of bog roll. And then, <laughs> the and then just <laughs> going to work. Right. Smelling a shite. <laughs> With khaki knickers. That is our... Boring moment of the week. Have we ever so given birth to one character before? I don't think it's ever been a zero sum game before, but there we go. There we go. If anybody was going to do it, it was going to be Chesney. <laughs> well, that wraps it up for another week, I think. Yes. This episode was brought to you with thanks to our friends of the podcast, Daisy and French Helen. Ooh la la. If you've ever run out of toilet paper, was it before or after? Write in to tell us. We're the talk of the street at gmail.com and we're at Corey Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and threads. Are we on Blue Sky yet? No, I'm still waiting for an invite. Invite us to Blue Sky, <laughs> friends of ours who are famous. You can shout me and Helen a coffee or become a friend of the podcast by heading to kofi.com. That's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. Check out the clicky clicky section of vogel.co.uk for links to our merch store and YouTube channel. And if you're so inclined, please leave a rating and a review on the iTunes or your podcast provider of choice. And be sure to check out our pop culture sister podcast, The List of Lists. Thanks for making it to the end of another episode. Thank you. And we will be back next week with more. The talk of the street. The talk of the street. Bye. Cheerio. Bye.